Yeah, Mike and I know each other well. Okay, all right. Yeah, he was, he's a professor of international studies at American University. He's you know, a legitimate academic and everything. And I've I heard him um, on, uh, on another program, and he talked about fleets of U-boats going down to Antarctica during World War II. And, you know, it, it kind of struck me is that, you know, here you are in the middle of, of a, a desperate fight, especially for the shipping lanes in the North Atlantic, and the Germans are sending all these, quote-unquote, fleets of U-boats down to Antarctica. Now, now, number one, I think that if you really want to look, you probably could find records of refueling. That, to me, that would be key to, to, you know, to buttress the argument that actually that actually occurred. And also... Hang on, um, hang on, hang on. You know, hang on, hang on, hang on. Sir. You know, this program, we interact a lot. I love to interact and interrupt because that's where you get to truth. Would you not think that if they were doing this covertly in secret because they did, tripped over the greatest discovery in the history of mankind and access to unlimited energy, unlimited biology, potential even more I mean, there was the, the, the science they could have tripped over, given they were looking for this kind of stuff all over the planet, would I think have encouraged a careful deception in the records. So just like I'm not sure that Admiral Byrd's diary at the uh, you know Ohio State University is real and not a copy, not a fake, I would be very suspect of finding anything in the records of refueling and all that, because if you want to hide a, your, your trail, you don't leave a record. Well, this wouldn't this wouldn't be incumbent on uh, to, to look on the German records. You you want to look at the records of the port, like the uh, Mar de, de, de la Plata in in uh, Argentina, for example, which would be probably the logical place where they would refuel. I would have. I, I, I think there there would probably be records of in, in going back into the into those days uh, that would uh, indicate that they were there. I mean, you, Richard, you probably remember the famous you know the famous Grops Bay incident. You know the pocket battleship. Oh, of course, British yeah. Destroyed yeah. In, early in the war. Well, that was you know. I mean, the, the Germans used the, the, that those ports in uh, Argentina. That yeah, but if Argentina you're running a really and everything else. if you're running a really clandestine program, think of it as the deep deep state. You don't want to leave a paper trail in case. Remember, this Antarctic gambit would have been viewed as Plan B. If they lost the war, that's where they were going to retreat to. They wouldn't have left a big bright set of signs saying this way to the entrance to the underground Antarctic bases. Brad, you've done a lot of work on this. What do you think? wouldn't advertise it at all. They would have tried to make it as hidden as possible. And that's why well, of we course. can't rule out that they did burrow underground as well using the technology of the Tote organization that did Fortress Europe, all the bunkers surrounding uh, the North Sea preparing for invasion. I mean, they, they, they brought that technology here and we started building our dumbs uh, continuity of government right during the Cold War. So they had the technology to go underground and there are huge tracts of land in Chile and Argentina, the size of some of our smaller states that are like their own country within a country kind of thing. Nobody really knows who works there and goes in there and who owns them even. And those were all bought up right before and during and after World War II. Keep in mind the money man, Martin Borman, he was the number two man at the end of World War II, Hitler's personal secretary. He was in charge of all the gold and all the loot that went missing after the war. And he kept popping up all over South America in the 1950s. Well, you know, it's, so, jo it's uh, Joseph Farrell's idea, a dear friend of mine and an excellent researcher yeah. and colleague. He has built a model which basically says that the the job of, of, uh, of Borman was to think ahead and to plan for the Fourth Reich in terms of Plan B and even Plan C. And I think with this incredible eruption of fascism all over the planet, including here, we're seeing the fruition of that plan. And the question is, can we stop it in time or are people too lulled into a false sense of security? Oh, it can never happen here. 
and we're watching it happening right before our eyes, and nobody's recognizing that this was a carefully articulated plan laid out 70-some years ago in case they lost. Well, I, let me let me let me jump in here. You know, it, it's I don't. It's not a matter of them advertising. I mean, they, the, the Germans wouldn't have any any uh, any uh, influence on the Argentine authorities to hide the records. Of course, they Jews. would. Now it's that, it's, put, it's put, called put, it's put it's it's, oh, it's hang on, put hang on, hang on, aside. hang on. Please, you make a statement, and I need to counter it. You can hide anything if you have enough money. You can buy anybody if you have enough money. They could have but completely the concealed there, their paper trail. Is this happening? Is there any record of that happening? I mean, like what you're talking, what you're talking about, um, the, you know, the Germans doing it in Antarctica on the scale that it that you're that you're saying that it might you're speculating that it might have happened. I mean, do you realize that, that uh, the building materials and everything else that they have to take, all the personnel, no, no, uh, the no, engineers, you're, 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 I mean, you're, they have to house them, they have to feed them. You're missing the point. I mean, you're missing the old point, so. which is they lived in the ancient structures themselves. There was no building going on. And in terms of energy, if you have diesel electric ships or submarines, you replace the diesel with an alternative electric power source that you found in one of these ancient archives in the Antarctic, you don't need to refuel anywhere. You're That's pure speculation. No, it isn't. Pure, it's the it's the heart of, of it it's, it's no. We don't know what happened or not. Neither do you, it's and you're. It, no, it's not. We are speculating. There's an ancient set of technologies. We find all kinds of evidence that, that exists. It has to have power. It has to have environmental protection, it has to have weaponry, it has to have a sophisticated technology waiting to be raided by whoever found it first, and the Germans found it first. And I'll also well, add that, that you chose your location. Saying, but we, we have, you, you've, got to, you've, got to, you've got to be able to provide more proof than that. Well, of course. You really have to. It's, of course. You need, I, we're, you, we're you totally in a gigantic claim, and you need gigantic proof. No, gigantic no. Proof. No, you don't. That is a fallacy. Sagan said, extraordinary claims demand extraordinary evidence. BS. Because what that does is set up a science as a psychological test where you can always change the goalpost and say, oh, your evidence is not extraordinary enough. I'm trying to deal with this as a level playing field. We know there are structures on the moon, Mars, and in the rest of the solar system. We know there are ancient structures in Antarctica. There's tons of evidence. We have all kinds of high-level people suddenly deciding to go to the Antarctic. We have an astronaut, Buzz Aldrin, second man to walk on the moon, who tweets out pure evil and is never the same again. They haul him out in a medevac. Why? What did he see that he could not keep his mouth shut because it meant something for the human race? This show tonight is devoted to the idea that this is not science fiction, it's science fact concealed under the rubric of cover stories and mis well, Richard, misdirection. Richard, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that, that, that it's not factual. I'm just, my, my whole one, I'm, what I'm wondering, what I'm, what I'm postulating is how did the Germans do the logistics? That's what I want to know. I mean, because to me, that, to me if you want to really nail this thing down and if you really you know people are going to want to know this because they're going to say well how the hell did this happen this is world war ii all right let me go it back to evidence we, we we don't have a lot of time we got about 15 minutes till the end of the no. show so sure. let me call let me, let me let, hey, yeah richard no i'll tell you what let ron you go first then i'll go second and brad if you want to add something please okay do. i i just want to yeah i just call her uh actually the story goes back a lot farther which helps figure out why somebody would be interested uh, remember Jules Verne? Uh, yes, sure. One of his books, uh, remember Captain Nemo? And yes, one of his books, besides 20,000 Leagues, is Mysterious Island, which was which fits in a uh, description, besides from being a bit more tropical than just played there, uh, look, looks to the mind very much like that uh, base near Deception Island that the uh, uh, Germans did have in Antarctica. There's no question about that. You know, it's, it's a beautiful harbor. It's the only one on the whole continent. And uh, it's also, there's 
as uh, Brad pointed out, uh, a volcano. And it fits perfectly the model of what Byrne was talking about, even though he'd uh, certainly never been to Antarctica. Well, well even with so 1930s, Ron, Ron, even with 1930s technology, you could, you could harness that energy as a geothermal source. So you don't have to truck right. in exactly. millions of tons of diesel. You've got a source that's infinite in terms of the bowels of the earth. You know, one thing Sella, Sella points out is that, 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 the, uh, that the Germans got help from the extraterrestrial sources as well. Yeah, what I call the family. Because remember, aliens are really rare and far between. Most of the interactions, I think, with folks from upstairs have been family. And then the breakaways join the family, and they want to come back, and that's a whole other set of shows. The, the point is, with limited resources, if you want to track down bills of lading in Argentina, you know, be my guest. But I would rather well, look. I would rather look. Do. I would rather look at satellite okay. imagery, talk to people who have been to the Antarctic, try to get someone to break cover, and try to find out why did all these notables, everybody from you know the the Orthodox Pope to Putin himself, go there in secret to do what? It's not like it's Vegas, and what stays in what you know takes place in the Antarctica really seems to stay in the Antarctic. Well, clearly, you know, there's a reason I'd why like people want to go there. If there's any anybody any of the any of the German technicians that were down there at the time have, have diaries or remember have what? About it. No, 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 no. Come on, remember what Kamler did to all those scientists in in Czechoslovakia the end of the war he had them yeah. shot so right. good luck finding engineers that have worked on the bases so all, these, so all these engineers and techs and everything uh, they were uh, just thinking. based on probably historical not everybody. well probably not everybody uh, nobody mentioned Chile there's a city halfway up in the mountains in Chile if you're headed up to look at the uh, very large array or those other telescopes that is, in, you know, it's a beautiful old Spanish city, and it's all full of Germans. Yeah. And in uh, back in, uh, when I was there... Yeah, hang on, hang on. Uh, Ron, 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 Ron. Good point. Brad, yeah. you were going to say something? Yeah. Uh, agreed. There are enclaves of Germans all over Chile and Argentina. In La Falda, in uh, Bariloche, as we discussed. I've been to Germany many times, and when I rolled into some of these towns, it felt like I was right there in Germany, and they have all the money. That's the joke in Argentina and Chile, because all the Native Americans are gone. There's only about 1% of Native American population in both of those countries. And so the joke is, well, who are these Argentinians? Uh, they're mostly Greek and Italians who immigrated over there. So the joke is, oh, they're Italians who speak Spanish, and wish they were as rich as the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> That's who Argentinians are. I remember Nobody looking in the phone book, and the, there were an awful lot of people named Schultz in there. Mm. Uh -huh. Sergeant? Yeah. Literally. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, caller. No, I. Just, I'm. 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 I'm sorry, caller. I missed your name. Was it Mike? Uh, Tim. 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 Thank you. So I'm look. Yeah. I'm not saying that all your questions aren't really damn good questions. It's a matter of resources and where do you put your energy? When you have limited resources. And I've enjoyed the show immensely. Well, thank you. Please come back. Okay, guys, I we've will. got have a good night. we've got about ten minutes till the end of the show. Brad, what have I missed besides your book? <laughs> so let's plug oh, your book. Uh, well, I, I just wanted to address the caller and and you brought this up too, Richard, that with geothermal activity down there, and Antarctica is the most volcanic continent in the world with 91 known active volcanoes, there you have a free energy source. Well, in terms, of, in terms of 30s, 40s, or 50s technology, but remember, the model is Hitler and company, the Abernabi, went there to find exotic, extraordinary, hyperdimensional energy sources. You know, it's kind of like that, that line in, in Back to the Future, where we're going, we don't need roads, because we have anti-gravity. So the idea that they would have been constrained to any of our normal 
technological ideas, I think is a little naive because remember, we have witness testimony from a guy with an impeccable background who then changed radically after he said it on the record. Kraft capable at going from pole to pole at unbelievable speeds. You don't do that with steam engines. Well, of course not, but it certainly helps to have a free energy geothermal source right there too. Not if you can type and in. That would heat up the mm -hmm. underground uh, caverns. Yeah, but and if you if, if, you, if you have access to hyperdimensional physics and tapping into the field, you don't need trivial sources like volcanoes. By the way, do you know why Antarctica is the most volcanically active place on the planet? There's several fault lines. No, 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 fail face. It's the same reason why um, Enceladus is the most active at the southern pole with the water gushing out from internal heat. It's because the physics is not distributed symmetrically around rotating stars and planets. It prefers one to the other, depending upon the uh, angular, uh, you know, angle of the rotation. And that's why on Earth and on Enceladus, and we think now Europa and some of the, some of the planets, major planets, the southern hemispheres and the northern hemispheres are radically different, like Saturn. The thermal activity and the physics of the torsion field is totally different North Pole to South Pole because the North Pole has the hexagon. The South Pole has this huge planet-wide cyclone rotating endlessly around the southern Saturnian Pole. So the very fact that there are more volcanoes and more heat emission coming up under the Antarctic ice than anywhere else on Earth is not an accident and it's where the Germans went to find out how that field is established so they weren't dependent on something trivial like heat. They could tap directly into hyperspace itself. Yeah, for sure. That's where they would go. And if you wanted to hide away anywhere on the planet and really the last unexplored fully known places on planet Earth are the deepest depths of the ocean and what's under the ice in Antarctica. Hmm. Ron, since you've done most of the work on this, yeah. talk about the New Zealanders and their amazing archives and photographs and expeditions, which nobody really knows about except you. Right, well, I heard it mentioned earlier by, uh, was, it, was it you? It or, was me, uh, it was moi. The guest? The, uh, no, no, it was me. Okay, yes. Okay. Yeah, that um, the New, the New Zealand is this jumping off point, and to this day, they I think they do more exploring in Antarctica than anybody else does. And I have this theory that if you're looking at something that's a cover up, the older the files you find, uh, the better. Yep. I mean that would apply to some things and not others, but in this case, we're talking field reports. And I found a lot of interesting things in the field reports from um, New Zealand expeditions, including one in, um, see, I'm looking for more pictures here, because that's where it ended up. Yeah, in Richard's section in uh, number eight, which has just a bunch of letters as a name, that's um, Taylor Dryland, the PDL stands for. It's somewhere attached to the so-called ice-free zone or dry lands in Antarctica, but I don't know exactly what. It says Taylor Valley, but, or, uh, but that goes um, that goes off a ways. And, uh, well, Brad would know what I'm talking about, but he's got maps. I don't have a map to show you yeah. right here. Anyway, take a look at that one, and you'll see that fellow in the top picture who, if you zoom in, he actually bears a great resemblance to Dr. Malin. Uh, Michael <laughs> Malin. That designed yeah, that designs the Mars cameras, but I, unless they have a fountain of youth down there as well, I doubt that's him, because this picture dates to 1958, at least that was the, I found it in an old paper in some, ar in some Harvard archives, and, uh, See, I'm more intrigued, Ron, frankly, I'm more intrigued, not with the guy, it could be Michael's father, for all we know, but right. I'm intrigued with the, quote, rock. Brad, are you looking at this? I sure am. What do you think, what, what, what is your 
first instant off the top of your head reaction to that quote rock here we go it looks like it goes in there quite deep some kind of erosion but also anthropomorphic of course we all see the face or skull in it too and i would believe this is in the dry valley not too far away from the Cardo, yes. one of the driest places on earth in fact they even practice using the Mars rover in mm -hmm. the dry valleys of Antarctica. Mm -hmm. It's a very mm -hmm. similar land. Brad, look past his landscape. head. Look past his head yeah. in the photograph. See, doesn't that, doesn't that look like a cowling of an engine? Yeah, it's weird. See, weird. I don't think these are rocks, a... gentlemen. I think these are melted machines. And the, the cover story is that it's wind erosion. I think, just like on Mars, we're looking at Maybe ancient weaponry, Brad, that left these extraordinary features. This is not the only place. They're all over the Antarctic, and they're dismissed as wind eroded. Uh, what, there's a technical term for that. Um, Ventifax. Ventifax. Yes. Ventifax, yes. Uh, and nobody noticed the pyramids? I'm looking at them. I did. Yes. Yeah, okay, the, the, the one that looks like it's going to bite out of on the left, if you look closely, that's the roof of a shelter. You know, that's part of the expedition's stuff there that's obscuring the view, but that's sure pointy for a, a talus slope or a rock or a pile of rocks. You mean the one on the right? Yeah, well, they're, bo they're both about the same. The one on the left is just partially obscured mm -hmm. by the roof of one of their tents. Yeah, which is that bright if you thing, look you know. That's oh. the bright white yep, square. Yep. Yeah, that's not it. But if they're further away. But no, I, I keep hearing about the pyramids in Antarctica. Yeah, it's the only picture I found that actually has them. And they obviously pose the pictures so that they'd include them in the picture. I want to ping them inside. There has to be rooms, tons of rooms. Hey, Brad, we got four minutes left. What do you want yeah. to leave the, uh, the audience with? Hey, just want to let people know if they want to find out more about me and the projects I work on. BradOlson.com, B-R-A-D-O-L-S-E-N.com, and CCC Publishing is my publishing website with all of my books and all of the authors that I publish. Any book orders of mine that come through the CCC Publishing website go through my office, so I'm able to sign copies for people to have a little keepsake from this conversation and all my research from the Antarctica trip are in my new book, Beyond Esoteric, Escaping Prison Planet, including some of these uh, maps that we've seen in my uh, photo spread uh, and explanations of what that was and more about Operation High Jump and Argus and many of the topics we covered tonight, Richard. And it was really great to connect with you and do this show, and wow, how fast three hours went by. You know, it's a good show, when it goes by that quick. So thank you for having me on again. I really enjoyed our conversation tonight. Well, we got a couple of minutes here. Talk about the book. What's, how do you wrap everything up in a neat bow in, in, in the latest book? Sure, so this book took me six years to complete including all the downtime I had last year during COVID, had to get it done. So this is the final installation in the three-part esoteric series. It starts with modern esoteric beyond our senses, which really begins with the antediluvian civilizations up to this modern age. Future esoteric, second book in the series, has a lot of the information on extraterrestrials and the secret state that has kept it all secret. They all tie in together, as you know, it's a big part of it all. And then so the final book, Beyond Esoteric Escaping Prison Planet, is then the final looking forward into what no 19th century occultist could imagine the world we live in today with transhumanism, with uh, human 2.0 emerging uh, into all that we're doing to ourselves, whether knowingly or unknowingly, through geoengineering and other programs that are changing the landscape of the planet as well as the human race. So just a lot of the chapters that uh, needed to find a home. 90 seconds. All put together in 
Beyond Esoteric, and it's just come out, and it's doing very well, and happy to be on the show tonight and have a chance to talk about some of those highlights, especially as they relate to the research in Antarctica that I put into this final book. Well, I want to thank you for being here. I think you have opened some eyes. I think Kim is thinking about alternatives, because uh, when, you, when you get into these subjects, if you don't think outside the box, you'll never find your way outside the box. So, one and all, thank uh, you for listening, for being part of the show as well. Tomorrow night, we segue once again to Mars, because, as you will hear, there are interesting, extraordinary connections. And I don't think it's an accident that things are coming to light right now, because as Brad just said, they are connected. So until tomorrow night, same time, same bad channel, third star on the left, straight until morning. Good night, everyone.